Okay, for our second lecture, we're going to talk about Mussorgsky. Mussorgsky as a part of the uh, nationalism trend in the, the Romantic period. If we had to give a definition for nationalism, the definition would be any musical expression intended to emphasize unique character and interests of a particular culture. And that would include national subjects, legends, folk material, instruments, dances, melodies, rhythms. So when we're talking about nationalism, it just didn't happen um, in Russia, but Russia was a very prevalent area that we see this nationalism, and especially with um, the famous Mussorgsky. Um, to give you a kind of a background uh, about how this national com nationalism comes about in Russia, we have to go back to actually to Peter the Great in 1703, because at that point there was a window to the West in St. Petersburg that they were able to actually open it so they had a lot of the influences of the West. This is very important because then of course, as you know, that then whatever you have in your country, you just wanna do what everybody else is doing outside of your country. But in 1825, we had certain writers like Pushkin, who was a very famous Russian writer that liked to actually write about Russian entities, as well as musicians like Glinka, um, who decided they needed to cultivate a uniquely Russian artistic tradition. There's a pride that kind of came with this as well. And Glinka, when we talk about Glinka, Glinka becomes like the father of this in the musical world. He was classically trained, Italian and German training, musical training. He was a professional civil servant, but he did music as a hobby. But he came out with this, A Life for the Tsar, in 1834, premiered it in 1836 for the imperial family, and he used a lot of folk music and liturgical chant. So he becomes the father of this group that actually Mussorgsky is part of, and that is the Russian Five. And the Russian Five were self-taught taught musicians, made a virtue of their technical ignorance, raised the flag for nationalism, stated um, the mission to glorify the spirit and music of Mother Russia. In the Russian Five, we have Balakarev, who was the actually sort of the head of it, and he was the professional musician of the group because Glinka was his teacher. But then we have Kui, who was an army engineer and a music critic. We've got Rimsky-Korsakov, who was a naval officer, but he was also um, uh, ultimately will, uh, would teach at the St. Petersburg Conservatory. In fact, some of the Russian Five felt that he sold out to do that. But the important thing about Rimsky-Korsakov is, is that people like Mussorgsky, his, their works, because Mussorgsky was like a diamond in the rough, sometimes their orchestration wasn't perfect or there were things that really would have stopped the, their, his works from being done, not only just in that period, but um, in the future, and as we know, there are so many works that are done today by the Philadelphia Orchestra and by p uh, pianists and what have you of Mussorgsky's. Um, so um, Rimsky-Korsakov was kind of a saving grace to, as a revisionist. The other was Bardeen, who was a chemical uh, chemistry professor. And what we noticed is is that again, in his case, he dies before he finishes the Prince Igor. So it's um, it's actually Rimsky who um, finishes his work. So just to get an idea that the Mussorgsky is part of this Russian five. The uh, works that I wanted you to look at besides, of course, the, the, the readings that, uh, that I wanted you to do, uh, we're gonna start with the Bar Skudinov. The Bar Skudinov was the opera. It's a very great example of a nationalistic opera by Mussorgsky, 1868. It has a prologue and four acts. You're gonna actually be seeing the coronation scene and I suggest that you go on YouTube and just Google coronation scene of Bar Skudinov so you can actually see it, so you can answer the questions about the nationalistic ideas that are prevalent. The interesting thing about the plot, the plot was based on a Pushkin um, work. Um, and in this work, um, it was based on a historical elevation of, or the reign of Bars, 1598 to 1605. Now you gotta understand that Boris was not to be czar initially because he was a favorite at the court of Ivan the Terrible. Ivan the Terrible dies, his feeble-minded son, Theodore, takes the throne. His other son, though, Dmitri, age of nine, is murdered. Who murdered Dmitri? Well, what happens is when Theodore dies in 1598, Dmitri is murdered, there's no, one to, there's no heir. 
And that's when Boris comes to the fore and people kind of like rally to have Boris as the czar, but he's really not the next in line. So we see that Boris um, becomes very, very important at that time. He gets carnated and then what happens is, is that at that point the people are rallying for him, but then during his reign, we notice that there's a lot of hunger and pestilence and so there's a lot of question about Boris from the people. So much so that in a monastery, there is a person doing research on Dimitri, the nine-year-old that was murdered and whatever, and tries to figure out at this stage of his life where he would be, what would he would be doing. And what he does is he actually goes out into the country and there's like this rumor that Dimitri never died, meaning that it's this, what we call pretender. Well, of course, Boris is becoming very, very uh, guilty about it because the question always was, was, did Boris actually murder Dimitri in order to get to the throne? So much so, he is so guilt-ridden that ultimately it will kill him. So it's a psychological drama as well. So um, the important thing about this that I want you to know is the libretto is written by Mussorgsky. Now you remember Mozart had the Ponte and we always had, and had Shekinator. Here you've got Mussorgsky writing the music and the libretto in Russian. It's very nationalistic. Rimsky Korsakov later on revises it and reorchestrates it so that it will live um, in it, uh, to be able to be performed again. Um, the uh, so the bar scooting off, I'd like you to see the coronation scene on YouTube so that you get an idea of the nationalistic characteristics of bar scooting off. Another work of um, Mussorgsky's I wanted you to uh, listen to and actually watch is The Night on Bald Mountain, 1867. It's about, it actually is a location of, of a mountain near Kiev. It's on a historic day, June 23rd, St. John's Eve, John the Baptist Day where the witches assemble to glorify Satan and hold their Sabbath. And if you remember that in one of the readings, you hear about the Russian work that actually describes this, um, uh, this moment in time. And the other thing is, is that Chernobog is known as the black goat. Well, that was the way that in a lot of um, Russian uh, storylines, uh, that that was the visualization of the, uh, of the devil as the black goat. It's a symphonic poem, meaning it's one movement. It's just orchestrated for one movement. Um, and I, ironically, it was completed on June 23rd as well by Mussorgsky. Very musically oriented and influenced by Liszt Totentanz and the Symphony Fantastica Berlioz. So when you're listening to it, see if you can hear some of those idioms in the work. I would like you to go to YouTube and actually uh, look at Disney's visualization of Mussorgsky's Night on Bull Mountain, which is in his very famous Fantasia. So you get an idea of how he visualized what Mussorgsky did in the symphonic poem for orchestra, one movement form. Again, very nationalistic. And the other work that I wanted you to know about was Pictures in an Exhibition. Pictures in an Exhibition was actually created because um, Mussorgsky's um, friend, Victor Hartman, who was an artist, um, died at a very young age. In fact, Mussorgsky even writes in his works, why should a dog, a horse, a rat have life and creatures like Hartman die? He's very taken by this death and very, very upset, grieved about this death. Um, in 1874, he um, writes this pictures in an exhibition after he actually sees an exhibition of Hartman's uh, work. And what you'll notice is, is that in between each one of the pictures, it's like someone walking, there's what we call a promenade theme. Now, what you're hearing is Mussorgsky's work for piano. That's what he wrote it for. But there are so many versions of pictures of an, an exhibition because it influenced so many other composers. Um, when the, uh, the last picture is the one that I would like you to listen to if you don't listen to the entire work, and that is The Great Gate of Kiev. The Great Gate of Kiev was an architectural design, just so you can say it. Um, it was a drawing by Victor Hartman for the competition run by the City Council of Kiev to commemorate the Tsar Alexander II escaping from assassination in 1866. Like I said, it was for piano, it's in 10 movements, 
it's a great example of a character piece, like when we talked about the programmatic aspects of piano music of this time. So when you're um, the the one the last movement is the Great Gate of Kiev. If you listen to the whole thing, you'll notice that there are a lot of different um, idioms of Russian nationalism in it and Russian folklore with Baba Yaga's hut, who is of course portrayed as the witch and her and her hut. And um, but there are other uh, nationalistic idioms in the pictures and an exhibition. So they are the works that I want you to associate with Mazursky. And when you answer the questions, think about the nationalistic elements of Mazursky um, and how he was able to portray all of this in his um, varied works because pictures and exhibition being for piano, the opera bar Skudinov, and the night on Bald Mountain, the one movement symphonic poem.